Our guest today is president of the Joyce Foundation, which has assets of $935 million and makes grants of roughly $50 million a year. The mission of the Joyce Foundation is to improve the quality of life in the Great Lakes region. Our guest today holds an honors degree in English from Brown University and a master's of management in finance and marketing from Kellogg. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the City Club of Chicago, Ellen Alberting. Ellen? Thank you, Thank you. have some Thank fun you. up here. Thank you. I, I, we've done a lot of acknowledgments um, to the point where you're probably feeling bad if you haven't been acknowledged, I don't know. <laughs> But I want to thank uh, a couple of people for being here. In particular, um, we have a wonderful, wonderful staff that really is behind almost everything I do and say. And um, there's a table full sitting in the back and a couple of people sitting in the front. I want to acknowledge and thank them for being here. But the toughest, this is a great audience to be in front of. I really had a great time doing this last year. The toughest audience of all, I um, imagine everybody in this room knows, is your own mother and father. And they are, <laughs> they are here today. And uh, I was feeling good till I found out they were coming. And then that really made me nervous. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Jay stole a little of my thunder in terms of explaining what the Joyce Foundation is, but I'm going to go, um, for those of you who didn't hear my talk last year or perhaps forgot what I said last year, I'm going to talk to you just briefly about what the Joyce Foundation is, and then I want to talk to, uh, about two of our top priority issues. Um, the foundation itself, as Jay mentioned, actually we have about a billion dollars in assets, but we still are giving away about $50 million a year, and our focus is on um, issues uh, that really affect the quality of life in the Great Lakes area. Um, when I explain to people what I do, they often say, well, you know, where did the money come from? Is it the Joyce 7-Up people? Is it the Joyce Moving Company? Is it this? It's, n it's none of those things. Um, it's actually a family that made a fortune in timber and um, also some mineral reserves in Iowa and in, and in um, Louisiana. The family moved to Chicago they were, at the time, very wealthy. Um, they were very prominent. They were all over the society pages. One of the members of the family managed to be um, in the gossip columns quite a bit. He was married many times and had all sorts of interesting divorces. Um, so he was out and about, but the, the fortune was left to Beatrice Joyce Keene. And at her death, um, she had established the foundation, and she left essentially all of the money to the foundation. Um, which at the time was $70 million. Markets have been good to us, and now we have close to a billion, while at the same time we're giving away quite a bit every year. So that's the background on the foundation. Um, there are no Joyce family members left, so we're a private foundation. We're tax exempt, which means that we've got the responsibility to use the money that we have for the public good. But because we're a private foundation, we have an enormous amount of freedom to choose what we focus on and the kinds of issues um, that we pursue. Our board's decision, and the staff is very much um, engaged by this as well, is that we should use this freedom to pursue both long-term concerns that, we're belie that we believe are critical to life in the re region, um, and also to take chances on things, to support some issues that could be considered very risky um, ones to work on. The two that I'm going to talk about today, but there are others as well, and I don't want to feel this, I don't want our staff members whose issues aren't getting covered to feel slighted, but I'm going to talk about water and guns, Great Lakes and gun violence. Those are the two things that I'm going to discuss. First, I'm going to start with water. I think long term, um, nothing is really more important to this part of the world than that great lake that's sitting just east of this building. Lake Michigan is the reason the city was built here in the first place. It's the reason you've got a nice, cool glass of clean water sitting in front of you. That water came right out of Lake Michigan. The parks, the beaches, the bicycle paths, and the world-class architecture along the shores of the lake are a big part of why we're all here and why we are so proud to call Chicago our home. 
we asked people a couple of years ago and found an incredibly strong reservoir of affection, pardon the pun, and support for the Great Lakes. Residents of this region see the lakes as unique and vital, both to use, which it is used, but also to protect. Their support is linked to their values about protecting the lakes for future generations. Their, the lang, people use language like their appreciation of what they see as God's creation and their respect for the beauty and balance of nature. 94% of Midwest residents say they personally felt a responsibility to protect the lakes, which is an extraordinary level of public support. If the lakes are important to the past and to our present, however, that's nothing in comparison to what they mean for the future. I think everybody is aware that the rest of the world is scrambling for water, and we're sitting on the largest supply of fresh water in the world, right outside our windows. Here's what Mark, Train, what Mark Twain once said about water. <laughs> Whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over. He said that 100 years ago, and he's right. Look at the recent headlines. Atlanta is about to run dry, and local officials, officials have no plan for what to do about it. Imagine an entire city turning on its tap and nothing comes out. That's what they're looking at. Can, wildfires are raging in California. There are a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is the extended drought that's ca caused that area of the country to get drier and drier. Lake Mead which supplies water for Las Vegas, is now at less than half of its capacity. And here's what a nearby area looks like. That's right near Lake Mead. A presidential candidate, Bill Richardson, is talking about taking Great Lakes water to feed areas just like this. He's backed away from that statement because people went a little berserk when they heard it. But it's not the, he's not the first guy to think about it, and he's not the first guy to come up with a plan to try to use our Lake Michigan water for their, to solve their problems. You might ask, why not share the water or even sell it? You know, it does seem like there's plenty to go around. But you have to remember that's not necessarily the case. The Russians had that idea about 50 years ago. They thought it would be a good idea to, to divert the rivers that feed the Aral Sea. They, were gonna, they grew cotton in the deserts of Central Asia. It seemed like a pretty good idea at a time. Let's look at a picture of what the Aral Sea now looks like. So I don't want to be an alarmist, but I think it's important to realize that without good planning and good leadership, this could happen here. The Great Lakes were created by a one-time event. The glaciers melted, they filled up with water. There's only a tiny percentage of that water that's replenished um, through rain and snowfall every year. What's there now is really all we have, so, and we really need to protect it. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of things that we've been working on for a long time. We've been supporting the Alliance for the Great Lakes, the National Wildlife Federation, and many others to make a vigorous public case for protecting the lakes. The governors in the region have taken up the cause. Um, they signed an agreement to conserve the Great Lakes uh, water and prevent diversions. But unfortunately, only two states have ratified that agreement. agreement. Why are the others taking so long? It's really unclear. Um, this compact also has to be approved by both the U.S. Congress and the Canadian Parliament, neither of which is a slam dunk. I'm glad to know there's somebody here from the Canadian Embassy um, who might have some comments on that. But the hardest part is going to be the actions of all of the people in this room because we've been so used to pouring the water out of the faucet, you know, leaving the water running, taking long showers, all those wonderful things. We're going to have to start conserving water because it's a precious resource. Um, oil is a pre precious resource that we have to conserve, but in some ways, water is even more precious than oil because there's no substitute at any price. Climate change is another big threat. Um, the warmer winters, people really don't like to complain about warmer winters, but one of the big factors is there's less ice on the lake. If there's less ice, there's, less, uh, there's more evaporation, which causes the lakes to lower. The lower the lake level is, the warmer they get. It's a vicious cycle, um, which is extremely unhealthy. So we've got to start now to prevent um, and possibly even reverse climate change. People are working on this. Um, Sadhu knows well that uh, next uh, month, early in November, a public-private task force is going to release the climate change plan for the city of Chicago, which has been an enormous effort that hundreds of people have been working very hard on, led by Sadhu. 
Nadu and his team. It's a very, very important um, project. Later in the month, a bunch of Midwest governors are going to announce a, their own plan to collaborate, which we're also really excited about and is going to engage both the corporate and public citizens. Um, basically, I think it has been decided by the governors and um, mayor, mayors and other local leaders, we just can't wait any longer for a national leadership that has totally failed us on this uh, issue. Okay, there's a number of other problems that the lakes face. There's polluted runoff that's uh, both from city streets and from farmers, invasive species, loss of wetlands, inadequate sewage systems. It's really kind of inexplicable that at this point some cities are still dumping untreated sewage into the lakes, or that Indiana and other states are even considering allowing increased pollution from factories and refineries. But that's going on and we all need to be aware of it and focused on it. Um, there are solutions though. Milwaukee, for example, is reworking its whole stormwater system to keep its sewage out of the lakes and off of our beaches. Our congressional delegation is pushing for a National Aquatic Invasive Species Act to keep, um, to keep invasive species out of, the, uh, out of the lakes, and there are other significant efforts going on in, as well. These are obviously long-term issues. The solutions are really expensive. But as I said at the beginning, uh, committing to and sticking with a long-term agenda is one of the privileges of working at a foundation. And in fact, we believe it's our responsibility um, to take that longer view. Um, it comes with our freedom. The other freedom that I mentioned um, is to take on tough issues. And I want to talk about one of them that is absolutely among the toughest, and that's guns. When I spoke here last October, the 2006-07 school year had just begun. Over the course of that year, from September through mid-June, 31 Chicago public school children were killed, the vast majority of them by guns. 31 young people, just shy of the total number killed at Virginia Tech, a shooting that, that raised an international outcry. But unlike Virginia Tech, most of the deaths in Chicago have gone unnoticed. Maybe that's because they happened one or two at a time. Maybe, maybe that's because they were young people from the inner city. Or maybe we've just gotten used to kids being shot. When young Blair Holt was shot on a bus at 3 p.m. coming home from school, somebody said to Arnie Duncan, well, I guess he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Arnie exploded. He said, that is absolutely wrong. He was in the right place at the right time. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. He was taking the bus home from school. How can he not be safe there? And how can we as adults not act to make our children safe? On the bus like Blair Holt, on the way to the candy store like 10-year-old Arthur Jones, coming home from choir practice like young Terrell Bosley, even Starkeesha Reed and Saritha White killed in their own homes. Before I go on, I want to acknowledge the parents of these murdered children who are sitting in the room. They are working very, very hard with us and with others to raise awareness of the, extent of, this, of the extent of the issue and the fact that it extends beyond the deaths of these children into their families and into their communities. If you could just raise your arms and um, let people know where you are sitting in the back of the room. Their courage and their um, ability to move forward in the face of these tragedy is really inspirational to the rest of us. As I say, these murdered children are not the only victims. Six other kids were wounded on the bus that day that Blair Holt died. Terrell Bosley had a kid brother who misses him terribly. Arthur Jones was walking with his best friend who told the story this way. I saw him fall, he yelled. When I looked down at him, he had a hole in his neck and he was bleeding. What kind of story is that for a 10-year-old to tell? What kind of wounds will he carry for the rest of his life? It does not have to be this way. We can do something about the proliferation of firearms that puts our children and the rest of our citizens at such dreadful risk. Chicago has outstanding local leadership committed to this task. Under Mayor Daley 
and Chicago Police Department Acting Superintendent Starks, and before him, Superintendent Phil Klein, Chicago has taken aggressive action to go after the nexus of gangs and guns that's responsible for so many shootings. They have done what they can to stop gun traffickers, get guns off the streets. In fact, last year they seized more than 10,000 guns. And in fact, Chicago homicides are down, which is a tremendous accomplishment, and we are very, very pleased at the progress they've made. But we have to recognize that it's also a tremendous tragedy that more than 300 Chicagoans, including several dozen children, lose their lives to guns every year. And no matter what Chicago does, we are not an island. You can cross McCormick Boulevard or Cicero Avenue and buy a dozen high-powered handguns. You can go to a gun show in Wisconsin or Indiana and get weapons without even submitting to a background check. You can drive to Mississippi and come back with a trunk load of military-style rifles. You can get armor-piercing bullets if you're thinking of shooting a police officer instead of a 10-year-old or a 50 caliber, snipe, 50 caliber sniper rifle, rifle if you'd like to take your chances at shooting down aircraft. I've got a couple of bullets here. You won't be able to see it way in the back of the room. Here is a shotgun shell, a normal sort of hunting shotgun shell. It's about as long as my thumb. This is a 50 caliber bullet. It's about as big as my entire hand. That's a 50 caliber bullet. You can pierce the side of an airplane from a mile away with this. You can buy a 50 caliber rifle, even if you're on the TSA's terror watch list and can't get on an airplane. Is that shocking? It's true. Shouldn't we make our gun policies at least consistent with our anti-terrorism rhetoric? We need common sense gun laws in this country. I'd like to thank Senator Dan Katowski, who's in the back of the room, has been a leader in, in um, our state legislature and has worked his tail off at great personal risk um, and taking a beating from a lot of folks on the issue. But you don't have to listen to me or to just, you know, some of our elected officials. Um, in, in September, the International Association of Chiefs of Police issued a call for change, and I'm going to run about a two-minute video from their press conference. Now, in an attempt to reduce gun violence, law enforcement and city leaders are coming together trying to find ways to cut crimes that involve guns, which, of course, in the end, would save lives. ABC 7's Karen Jordan joins us with more about that. Karen? Well, Linda and Alan, those law enforcers, politicians, as well as public health officials found 39 ways to combat gun violence. It threatens large cities and small towns across the country, as well as police officers and the citizens they're supposed to protect. This is a disease. This is like a cancer. This is a virus that's been unloosed in the city of Chicago. Willie Williams is talking about the gun violence that killed his son, Willie Williams III. The 17-year-old died in a shooting last spring at Ford City Mall. Williams joined other fathers who lost children to gun violence to support law enforcers who called for an end to the deadly trend. We are all united to give this message. This madness must stop. Knight says the keys to making that happen are found in this report, Taking a Stand, Reducing Gun Violence in Our Communities, issued by the International Association of Chiefs of Police. It lists 39 recommendations to combat gun violence, including removing any firearms by law enforcers during domestic violence calls, requiring all gun sales to take place through federally licensed dealers, and permanently banning assault weapons and armor-piercing ammunition. It is our hope that all citizens and those that represent them take the opportunity to read the report, embrace their personal role in the fight against gun violence, and then do something about it. Mayor Daley praised the report and says the next step is to see how lawmakers can actually put the recommendations in place. I believe that most Americans support common sense gun legislation, both at the federal and state level, that help ease the access, really, the access to guns while protecting the rights of all these gun owners. We can only make things happen if we muster the collective courage to stand up to the small, well-funded interest group that, plot, that blocks common sense laws at every turn. 
and that in its turn will require that we as a community of Chicago leaders get this issue back on the agenda of Congress, urge legislators in Springfield to pass reasonable laws, and put the resources we need into Chicago communities where children are most at risk. We're working right now to launch such an effort in Chicago. We've been working on the issue for years, but we're going to put a special focus in Chicago um, with, with the approval of our board um, in December, I hope, but um, I, I think they'll be supportive. We're going to put an extra couple of hundred thousand dollars on the table to support a local initiative. We plan to meet with community leaders and other Chicago funders to work through the details, but we'll pull together uh, community organizations, religious leaders, doctors, and many others, including the parents of victims, who have already stepped up, determined to take back our community from violence. I'm going to give you a couple of ideas for what the agenda might look like. On the policy side, and at the top of our list, are universal background checks for gun sales, reducing the firepower available to gangs and criminals, no more 50 calibers, choking off the flow of illegal guns into the city, mandating reporting of lost and stolen firearms, and licensing, state licensing of firearms dealers. All of these are supported by the police chiefs, they're broadly supported by Illinois voters, and that includes gun owners. 79% of gun owners strongly support the reporting of lost and stolen guns. 60% of gun owners express strong support for universal background checks. There are lots of other people with great ideas on how to protect kids. We're talking about providing safe places for them to go after school, providing safe passage for them on their way to and from school, providing counseling for the many, many kids who observe gun violence in their lives. Those are all important ideas, and we look forward to working with the social service agencies that are developing them. But ultimately, we want the guns off the streets. We don't want them exposed to violence so that they have to get counseling because they've ex been exposed to violence. We believe that changing public policies to stop those who would flood our communities with guns is what we really need to do to protect our children. So, thank you. I can tell you it's not a real easy issue to work on, but um, I appreciate your support on it. Our, our focus on these two issues, both of which are really urgent, water and guns, is really not just an academic exercise. It's an attempt to define our common values as a society. It goes without saying that everyone values water. We can't live without it. But do we need a crisis like Atlanta or a battle with the Western states in order to act? Similarly, everyone agrees we value children, but what does our behavior say? Do we value the right to own handguns more than we value the right to send our kids off to school each morning without fear of them dying from a bullet? Our generation is being challenged like none before to think about the consequences of our actions from global warming to conservation to fighting terrorism. How do our common values shape our actions? One of the things a foundation like Joyce can do and we believe we should do is to stimulate public discussion on these issues and others and to help drive people of differing opinions toward common solutions and ultimately to help us all recognize that we have common values and that if we want those values to mean something, we have to live by them. This is not an easy task. Ask any journalist who writes about gun policy, you'll hear about the intense criticism they get, and we hear it too, because we're, we're identified on the issue, but we're willing to stand up to it. Ask anybody who works on tough environmental issues when they come into conflict with business interests. That can be hard too. But trying to make progress, even on tough and contentious issues, is a responsibility that comes with the privilege of working for a private foundation, but it's also a responsibility of citizenship. I invite you to join us. Thank you. So me and my bullets are willing to take questions. Ellen, I'm Joyce Saxon. I'm Joyce. on the board of governors of City Club. The case of British Petroleum on the Indiana border 
made a lot of noise in the press and then it disappeared when they sort of half backed down. What has happened currently? Where are they? Are we all forgetting about them and they're going ahead and polluting? I, it's, an interesting, um, it's an interesting case to bring up. That is, uh, I think that one of the reasons people responded so much to that story is that there is this underlying support among most of the region's citizens um, that they want to protect the lakes, they think it is protected, and when they find out that there are loopholes, it's extremely upsetting to people. Sadhu is probably more equipped to say exactly what's going on on that uh, particular subject, but one thing that's happening around the region is that there, are, there is uh, an alarming number of conversations going on that, um, of states possibly letting permitting going through that would be similar to the BP situation. And right now, there are about 30 people sitting in the conference room in my office figuring out what a response to that ought to be. Uh, Leighton Olson with the law firm of Howe and Hutton. Two questions. One, on water, with the Olympics potentially coming to Chicago, I was wondering whether the Joyce Foundation is uh, looking at ways to bring in water-related people from around the world because there will be a lot of water sports and we'll be hosting things uh, related to the lake. And on the, the second question having to do with gun violence, uh, have some of your uh, explorations gone to the questions of insurance uh, for gun owners, perhaps of uh, high firepower, so that if you actually have one of those, you have a responsibility and then, you know, if it's lost, you better, uh, you better report it or you have certain uh, insurance yeah, uh, implications. Uh, two very interesting thoughts. No, we have not thought about um, bringing water people if we do get the Olympics. That is a wonderful idea, and um, we will pursue that um, if we get the Olympics. But I love, I love that idea. I think that's a really good one. On insurance, um, we've been really interested in the question of how um, the insurance industry might be impacted, or be, I hate that, but be impacted by gun violence. And um, we have specifically looked at um, the question of, sh is, is there a higher rate of home invasions in houses where there are guns? And in fact, there is evidence that people who have guns, there is a higher rate of home invasion because someone else finds out that they have a gun and wants to steal the gun, or for whatever reason, there is a higher rate of home invasion. Should insurance companies look at that and, and charge more insurance for people who ha keep guns in their homes. So that's a kind, we have thought, that's one example of the kinds of thinking we've done on the insurance front. Um, it's, I would say it's a, you know, an area that's not been mined fully. Thank you. Hello, I'm Zoe Mikva, and I'm on the board of the Mikva Challenge, which works with high school students on public policy issues. We are proud supporters and of the I know that. Challenge. I was going to say that next. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the number one issue for all of the students we work with is safety in school and in the neighborhood. And uh, uh, so our students do work on this issue. I, I feel as though you took us a certain distance, but I don't have a mandate to go home with and do something mm -hmm. because you didn't tell me what legislation is on the table, where it stands, how you know how, who we have to convince, who our enemy is, who our friends are, and how we exactly how we proceed from here. I would love to hear. So you are um, a very sophisticated consumer, and I um, acknowledge that. <laughs> a couple of things immediately to your right, Zo. If you would look at the table to your right, Nina Vinnick from the legal, uh, legal, committee, legal Committee Against Violence, I should know this since we're a big funder, um, <laughs> is a national expert on the legislative status of gun laws throughout the country and particularly knows everything about what's going on in Illinois and is a fabulous resource on that. I want to say that um, the Joyce Foundation is prohibited by law from um, lobbying. And so for us to get into too much of a conversation about legislation isn't really appropriate. But many of the people we work with, and Nina would be the first person I'd send you to, um, will have a lot to say about that. The other is I'd really like to have you involved in our community organizing efforts over the next couple of months. So if you don't mind, I'd, I'll be giving you a call. I think having kids' voices is really important. And not too many groups do a better job than you do on um, eliciting and, and uh, trumpeting kids' voices on important issues. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Carlos Ponce, and I'm on the Board of Commissioners for the CHA. Uh, congratulations on your uh, gun initiative for this December. We look forward to it, and I'm going to want to find out about it. Maybe we can do something from our end. Uh, but a question for you in reference to what the prosecutors and the courts might be doing in reference to guns. When someone commits a crime or is in the process of committing a crime with a gun or other weapon, what sort of conviction rates and what sort of sentencing is occurring in those instances? I can't answer that. I just can't I, answer I that. I assume that if you commit a crime with a weapon, that that's, al that's already an illegal action. Right. There are, there are plenty of laws on the books, and the, um, the law enforcement community is all over this, and we know that um, efforts like that are effective. Unfortunately, if there is a un never-ending flow of guns into communities, you're just not going to be able to get it all at the back end. So we're, we're trying to avoid having all of the guns there and the crimes being committed. We're trying to choke it off at the beginning. And, and the, the law enforcement community is doing everything it can once the crimes are being commuted, and the, and the prosecutors as well. We're saying let's reduce the flow of guns into these communities to begin with. Let's give her a round of applause. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Ellen, we have a couple gifts for you. First of all, it's very classy to bring your parents. Let's give them a round of applause. Not only for you, you have a wonderful daughter, but it's very smart of you. Ellen, this is for you on behalf of the City Club. Here's a history. You have two of these now and a one-year membership to the City Club of Chicago. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.